Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a bowl of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Alex. Our brave leader, Sean, could not be here this week, so you're just stuck with me. But we still have some fun stuff to talk about. But before we do that, let us thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they are the AHL minor league affiliate of your Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly affordable prices. The American Hockey League season is underway, and you can watch the games by subscribing to AHL TV. You can also check out IceHogs.com, get yourself some merchandise, hat, shirt, jersey, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Okay, so let's get into some Chicago sports talk, shall we? That's what we like to do here. We got some Bears talk. There is some Bears news that we would like to get to, and of course, there is the rumors of a certain quarterback that right now plays for the Seattle Seahawks that are just not going away. We also have some Bulls and some Blackhawks and maybe a little spring training as well. So let's start with the Bears. One of the biggest news pieces this week in Chicago sports was Allen Robinson being franchise tagged by the Bears. A lot of people were nervous about Allen Robinson playing next year on the Bears, you know, for obvious reasons. He still hasn't been extended yet, and Allen Robinson and many others would feel that he deserved to be extended by now, and that's very understandable. He's a very good wide receiver. He's done a lot for this team and has definitely, you know, expressed his feelings about it, and, you know, he's not shy away on being honest about his situation or where the team is. I mean, look at the offense the past few years, going through multiple quarterbacks and just having so many aches and pains just trying to move the ball. He's your best asset in terms of offense. He is your number one star player on offense. Yeah, you got David Montgomery. He's very good. You have a few good interior linemen, but far and away, it's Allen Robinson. So he gets the franchise tag from the Bears. And while a lot of people were concerned, it seemed like most football experts were pretty much predicting that this was going to happen. Now, it is still, in my opinion, very important for the Chicago Bears to get an extension done sooner than later. You want it done before midsummer. You really do. Because he will be in place before next season starts. He will have his extension. We won't have to worry about it. He won't have to worry about it. The Bears won't have to worry about it. I mean, it just needs to be done. But as it stands right now, franchise tag for Allen Robinson. And next year, $18 million. That's what he's going to be making. And you look at the franchise tags around the league. He's right behind uh, Brennan Scherf. I think I'm saying that right. A guard from uh, the Washington football team. And uh, Leonard Williams on the Giants. There's also Quis Good- uh, Godwin. He got franchise tag. Cam Robinson of the Jaguars got franchise tag. Taylor Morton, Justin Simmons, Marcus May, and Saints Marcus Williams. So those are the names that got franchise tagged. Uh, Leonard Williams got just over $19 million, a total of $182.5 million salary cap um, is where we're at right now. So those are the values based on that number. So there you go. Um, But, you know, the the Bears have made other moves. There was an extension made, and it was defensive Ed Mario Edwards. It was a three-year deal, and it was just reported, it was either today or yesterday. It looks like it was reported today. But three-year deal for Mario Edwards, it's worth $11.55 million. 
and Edwards will garner $4.5 million in his first year. And you know, he was a depth piece, a solid one. He was a second rounder in 2015, originally drafted by the Raiders. And he's played with a number of teams, and he ended up on the Bears this year. Played in all 16 games, didn't start a game, but, you know, he played in all 16 of them. So, you know, you got a depth piece there, locked up. It's not Allen Robinson, but hey, you know, it is a move. The other notable move was Cairo Santos getting a nice five-year deal. Worth up to $16 million, according to the ESPN report. So I think we could say goodbye to Eddie Pinheiro. Thanks for that epic game-winning kick in 2019 against the Denver Broncos. But you got to give a lot of credit to Cairo Santos. He got the opportunity with the Bears last year. I know he missed two kicks early on, and it looked like, oh boy, here we go. But then he just made the rest of them. 30 of 32 field goals, 36 of 37 extra points. And he broke Robbie Gold's record for consecutive field goals. 27 attempts in the regular season in a row. And then you had a field goal he made in the playoffs. So good for Cairo Santos. And, you know, hopefully he can keep that up. He's had a very strange career, but we have seen him be successful even before the Bears. I mean, when he came to Chicago, it, you didn't really think much of it. And then Pinheiro got hurt, and you just prayed that you can get by with Cairo Santos, and he ended up being great. And not only was he making his kicks, many of those kicks were very good. I mean, I know it only matters you get him between the uprights, but, you know, he was drilling those kicks. I think it was the one in, it was in Carolina. He made the one in Carolina that was over 50 yards, and he just hit it perfectly. That pretty much summed up his season. He had a couple of game winners. He had the game-winning kick against uh, the Buccaneers, against Tom Brady. You know, that was, it wasn't at the buzzer, obviously. They still had to make a defensive stop, but, you know, that was a big kick. And even though they lost the game in overtime against the Saints, he did make a time kick late. So, you know... He came up big when he needed to. There weren't many games that came down to a kick, but, you know, every field goal counts when your offense doesn't do much through most of the season. So that's a nice bit of news there. I think people were very happy to hear that. So, God, remember when we thought that the Bears' only problem was kicking? When we thought that everything on this team was in place perfectly but the kicker? And now it goes to show that there's a ton of holes and there's a ton of problems. But now the kicking is just great. It's just fine and dandy. Imagine if we had Cairo Santos in 2018. I know, I, I, won't, go, I won't go down that path. That's, that's too painful to think about. But good for Cairo Santos. That's really cool. Now, I gotta bring it up. I, I really try not to read too much into it. But here they are, still alive, the Russell Wilson rumors. You look at what some of the experts are saying. Bob Condota, Seattle Times staff reporter, wrote about it very recently. And he used Ian Rappaport as one of his sources. It seems like there's not a lot going on. There's not a lot of engagement between the Seahawks and the Bears. There's not a lot of exchanging of words, if any. We know the Bears seem to be interested. And I think Seattle is listening. I mean, if you're Seattle, you're going to listen. I mean, that's what GMs do. But in terms of anything steady happening, it's a long way, according to Rappaport. And we know he has a no-trade clause, and we've heard the you know reports that the Bears would be one place he'd be willing to go. We've heard words of him being intrigued by Chicago. We've heard a lot of things. Now, you hear the reports of them being far from anything materializing. So we get that there's nothing, there's likely nothing close right now. But these talks are still here, and you do hear other people say. That, while it is unlikely, 
it's not impossible. There is a lot that would have to happen. And there's a lot of speculation on what a potential package to the Seahawks could look like. We're talking multiple first rounders. We're talking throwing in guys like there, like, you know, Akeem Hicks could be thrown in there. Or some of their other guys, like Kyle Fuller. Some of their big defensive guys. Because let's face it, if Seattle, if Seattle was planning on bringing in a new quarterback, either via the draft or whatever, they would probably want some defensive players coming back because their defense is awful. If they, if they were going to make a trade and send Russell Wilson to the Bears, stockpiling some picks and getting some defensive players, you know, that would tell me that their replacement would be coming soon so they can get those defensive players from the Bears and then try to make that contend right away. But the thing is, how does that work? It's not like the Bears have a high first-round pick. It's later in the first round. And your top talented quarterbacks are going right away. So does a first-round pick in this upcoming draft from the Bears do much for you in the short term? Drafting his replacement. See, this and the fact that the Bears don't have a ton of trade assets, it really just doesn't seem likely that there is going to be a trade here. I'm not saying it's impossible. We could be shocked. We could be shocked. There's just so much that's going to have to happen for this to be a thing. I mean, we're talking about Seattle trading away Russell Wilson. And, you know, you can hear all the rumors about being unhappy. You can kind of connect some dots. Pete Carroll likes to talk about running the ball. Pete Carroll likes to make a talented quarterback like Russell Wilson into a game manager. Sure, it's, it's easy to think that Russell Wilson wouldn't like that so much. And maybe that he'd be able to let himself shine in another environment. And I know that the Seahawks have a lot of issues. Again, their defense sucks now. The Legion of Boom is long gone. But Pete Carroll has that team contending every year. And I know the Bears have made the playoffs two out of the last three years, but come on. Eight and eight in the seventh seed this year. Eight and eight and missing the playoffs the year before. Obviously, things were pretty hype in 2018, but, you know, that faded pretty fast. Where the Seahawks, I mean, they make the playoffs every year. Pete Carroll has won the big game. Sure, we could talk about not running with Marshawn Lynch the following year. But, you know, Pete Carroll has won some big games, including a Super Bowl. And Russell Wilson uh, won those games with him. I mean, it's different than the Texans where you understand why the hell Deshaun Watson would want the heck out of there. I mean, that is a tire fire of epic proportions. Now, do I think Russell Wilson would be more willing to come to the Bears? than Deshaun Watson? Yes. I just don't think that it's likely they're going to trade him. I, I, again, I'm not saying it's impossible. This is just how I see it right now. And right now, the Bears fan base is tearing their hair out, hitting their heads against the wall, trying everything possible to see the possibility I believe I read somewhere, because, you know, forgive me, I don't use Twitter really anymore, like I was on 24-7 in years past, but, you know, I, I did hear that people were going crazy when the bet lines for the Chicago Bears Super Bowl changed, what was it, a few nights ago? It was last week sometime. And it was just trying to connect all these dots, and it was getting very conspiracy-like with theories of Russell Wilson. And, I mean, the truth is, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. We have no idea. We're getting the reports from the experts. We're getting the temperature check from the experts. And right now, things seem pretty cold. Ice cold water being poured on hopes. But the hopes have not been completely diminished yet. Because there is still a small possibility. I think it's razor thin. But having razor thin possibility is better than zero. And right now, I think the possibility is razor thin. There is some small 
bit of hope. It's not completely dead yet. But I'm not counting on it. I would love to see it happen. And look, if we had to trade a defensive player to get a great quarterback, do it. We've stockpiled on great defensive players for years. And where has that gotten us? It's not the 80s. Days are long gone. Look at the great defense we had in 06. Got us to the big game, but then it showed where not having a great quarterback can hurt you. You could say the same thing a few years later. And then you can say the same thing in 2018. The defense was extraordinary in 2018. But while Trubisky, I think at the time, showed some promise, it just wasn't enough to carry you. I mean, when you think about it, and I don't want to take too much away from Trubisky in 2018 because he had some big games and he did ball out in the fourth quarter of that playoff game. But you got to remember the first three quarters of that playoff game, the offense was just a train wreck. I mean, if you give them a good quarterback on that team, they win that first round game against the Eagles handily. But th that's a whole other tangent. My whole point is if you have a chance, any sort of chance to try to get a great quarterback and a lot of experts will also tell you this. The reason why that thin, razor-thin margin of being able to get a guy like Russell Wilson is there is because of, death, of the desperation of Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy. They know that they either got to win or they're fired. They're playing for their jobs. They're not thinking about the 2023 draft right now they're not thinking about seasons ahead they are thinking purely about 2021 you want to trade assets you want to trade draft picks and a player or two to get russell wilson and try to maximize your efforts to win now by bringing in a great quarterback they're going to be thinking about that over the long-term future they will completely f up the future if it means short-term success because it'll save their jobs it's it's kicking the can down a road i mean that's just the situation of it if they were recently hired and they were looking to you know establish their own base establish their own philosophy establish a long-term plan things are different but right now you're supposedly in a window where you have a good enough defense to contend you just need to solve some issues on offense mainly the quarterback and you want to do that now before the defense gets too old. Because let's remember, this is football. These are defensive players. You don't have as long a windows as you have in, say, hockey or basketball or baseball. You have maybe a few years of prime in this defense left. Some could say it's declining already. And I, I do think that it can still be great if you have the right coordinator and you hope that the new one can can work on getting this defense back to where it was more like the Fig Fangio days, whereas we saw a lot of softness with Chuck Pagano. But, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to replicate 2018 no matter what. But my point being is you still have enough talent on the Bears now to add an essential piece or two where you can give yourself a chance to win. But if you don't really add that, then you're stuck in mediocrity. I mean, you got to do something. You don't get Russell Wilson, and you don't get Deshaun Watson. I mean, your options right now. I mean, you're looking at Gardner Minshew, Sam Darnold, or even Alex Smith. You're most lo likely looking at options like those. Smith, Darnold, Gardner Minshew just to name a few. You want to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo, the game manager extraordinaire? None of those options put you over the top. Those options, Some of those options might be able to get you by okay, but I mean, in terms of a Super Bowl, they're not going to put you over the top. If you would have given me Russ, um, Alex Smith a few years ago, I think you're talking different, but you know, we all know what happened to Alex Smith, and you got to give him a ton of credit for what he did, and you know, to be completely honest with you, I wouldn't hate an Alex Smith guy on the team, a guy like him, 
you know, his, his presence, I think, would be a positive. But you're at the point in his career where it's not an over-the-top move. It's really a bridge, if anything. And I don't think Sam Darnold would improve here. If Sam Darnold is going to go somewhere, go to Denver. He's got a better chance of succeeding in Denver and maybe finding something in Denver than he does here. And I'm sure there are other quarterbacks out there we could talk about, but you get my point. So we're just going to have to see what happens. And that's really all I have on the Russell Wilson stuff. I don't want to get my hopes up too much. If I'm pleasantly surprised, I will be very pleasantly surprised, like you couldn't imagine. But I'm not holding out on it. So that's the Bears. I want to move on to some other sports here. I guess we'll move on to the Blackhawks. They have kind of fallen back to earth a bit this past week or so. And, you know, it's not surprising. It was probably going to happen eventually, especially against this part of the schedule. They got manhandled in Dallas that first game. A 6-1 to loss. Sorry, Patrick Kane, your 1,000th game was not, not good. Not good at all. And uh, shout out to my friend Jordan. She was there with her dad at the game. Very excited. They were in their Blackhawks gear. Ready to see Patrick Kane's 1,000th game. And then the Blackhawks did that. But hey, going to a hockey game, is it's got to feel great. I miss going. Um, and then they stole a win against Dallas in the second game. They got heavily outshot in like the first two periods. But they scored four goals, and they won four to two. So you'll take that. Then they go to Florida. They play a pretty good first period. They don't score, but they definitely were the better team. Then they get on the board early. Brandon Hagel, who continues to play very well. I really like Brandon Hagel. Puts them up one nothing, And then four unanswered goals by Florida, and they lose four to two. They can still have a really good shot at making the playoffs if they just kind of coast because all the other teams below them are pretty far out of it. Columbus is the only one that I think can threaten that spot, but you know, Dallas has really disappointed this year. Detroit is obviously going to be way down there. Nashville's not that great. They're they're pretty far down there. So if the Blackhawks kind of coast their way through the rest of the season, yeah, they could probably make the playoffs. Don't think they get very far. I know hockey can be kind of a crapshoot. I mean, look at last year when the Blackhawks made the playoffs. They beat the Oilers in the first round, which I don't think a lot of people were expecting. But the rebuilding Blackhawks could be playoff bound, but I, I think that this stretch is showing that while this team has played much better than we thought, and maybe there is more to them than we thought, they are still a team that's not necessarily built to win. And, you know, they're very young. They're very inexperienced. You're going to get growing pains. You're going to see some things even out. Because, you know, with hockey, there's so much puck luck to it. You saw them steal a few games with goaltending. And then you saw a few games when they just got lit up. You know, with a young team, a lot of fluky things can happen. But it's nice that you're seeing night in, night out, contributions from young kids. I mentioned Brendan Hagel. You can mention Pew Suter. You can mention Kevin Lakinen. And then, you know, you can look at the veterans of the group. Patrick Kane is still one of the top players in the league. Duncan Keith is still playing pretty well. Alex Debrinkit has rebounded very nicely. And, you know, you have kind of scrappy guys like Ryan Carpenter who have played better recently. Connor Murphy is just hitting dudes left and right. And, you know, you look at Ian Mitchell, too, another young guy. He's starting to kind of make his name noticed. And Adam Bogfist, uh, you know, Bogfist, I still think, has some things to work on. But I feel like he's taking some positive steps forward. You know, you, you like to see some progress better than none. But, you know, you just let them play and let them do what they do. And, you know, regardless of where they finish this year, if they can keep being, you know, keep putting in a good effort and showing promise, that's going to build confidence for them going forward. I mean, this this is such a tough stretch because you're playing in Florida, 
Then you got to play in Tampa Bay. I mean, this stretch is the most brutal stretch of the season. I would like to see them get one win against Florida. If you could win one more against Florida, which, you know, you haven't beaten them yet, and if you could steal one in Tampa Bay, you know, okay. Okay, I'm not expecting much more than that at this point. We've seen games really get away from the Blackhawks. We've also seen games where, even if they're not playing their best, they're able to step up at, you know, in big moments and be able to deliver. We saw that game against the Lightning where Malcolm Subban beat them in the shootout. They were getting so heavily outplayed in that game. But Malcolm Subban kept them in the game, and they were able to win in the shootout with, you know, combination of some big saves and a clutch goal. Was it, uh can't remember who scored it in the shootout, but it's a really nice goal, and they were able to get the win. So, you just hope they can keep playing hard. And, you know, maybe get a few more wins before this road trip is up. I don't really have much more to say, other than going back to Kane's 1,000th game. We mentioned seeing Jonathan Taze. You know, we saw Jonathan Taze in the tribute. Before that, and you saw a bunch of other people. You saw Marion Hosa, you saw Coach Q, and that was really cool. It was really cool to see. What I think was sad was seeing Jonathan Taze, knowing he's not healthy, and you know he he looked. Maybe it was the camera. I don't know, but I could definitely tell there was something not right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical expert. I can't tell you what it is. And, you know, maybe it's my mind just telling me that. But I could just tell physically there was something not right with him. And I just hope he's okay. I really do. We say it every week on this show, but I'm going to say it again. I just really hope the guy's okay. Hopefully we hear some good news soon. And we don't want to be too intrusive. We don't want to be pestering about how he is, because, you know, it is a private matter, it's his business, but I would love to hear sometime soon that he is going to be okay. Just, you know, for the sake of caring about Jonathan Taze. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. But hey, and you know, Kirby Doc is starting some activity. So there's some good news. That wrist injury looked horrific. So seeing him skate again, that's pretty good to see. I mean, Kirby Doc is going to be a very important piece for this Blackhawks team going forward. What I think is going to be really important is once you get Doc healthy, you know, whenever that is, and he's able to continue to grow his game, and then you have Debrinkit rebounding, as he continues to do, and you have Patrick Kane continue to do what he does. When you add Kirby Doc in the mix, all of a sudden, you have another great young player in the mix with all these other guys. And that's going to help continue boost this so-called rebuild that the Blackhawks are doing. So there is a lot of positivity just looking at the young guys. And it could only get better once Kirby Doc is fully healthy and playing again. Because I still think he is a very good asset. I know people weren't thrilled with the pick when it happened, but I remember a lot of the experts saying, you know, he might not be the defenseman, the shiny, fancy defenseman that everybody wanted for the Blackhawks. But man, oh man, there is promise there with Kirby Doc. So hopefully he's going to be ready as soon as possible. And I realize that he's probably still a ways away from actually playing in games again. You know, it's still a long road ahead, but seeing him take the steps... That's a pretty important thing. That's all I really had on the Blackhawks as they continue to play. Let's shift gears to the other United Center team, the Bulls. Hasn't been particularly pretty lately. They are on a bit of a skid. Really yucky game against the Miami Heat. And you're seeing some things get shifted around a little bit on the roster. And... It's not something you necessarily want to see, but this is where we are. We're seeing a starting lineup change under Billy Donovan. He is deciding to move things around a little bit. Kobe White and Wendell Carter Jr. are going to be on the bench, and you're going to see Thomas Sadoransky and Thad Young 
take their places. I mean, Thaddeus Young has played pretty well for the Bulls, so you get somebody who's pretty reliable there. But you just wish that Kobe White and Wendell Carter Jr., two guys who you would hope to have been continuing to grow as they are part of this rebuild, you know, seeing them go to the bench is tough, but, you know, you kind of understand why. Wendell Carter Jr. is struggling, man. It's, it's not been pretty. And I know he's been hurt a lot. And that is probably really hurt his development. And Kobe White, a guy who I've just stood by and still think he has talent, you know, a lot of the turnovers, some of the fundamental things, you know, they're just not all clicking right now. And, you know, props to Billy Donovan for identifying a problem. You know, he he acknowledges that there needs to be some sort of change here. You know, you can argue all day that they're not supposed to be winning. They're supposed to just kind of seeing what he has. But, you know, Billy Donovan clearly still wants to be in games and win games. And you got to establish a winning culture. So the fact that he is making these moves, I think, is beneficial for not only White and Wendell Carter Jr. potentially, but just as the game as a whole. He's not saying, well, let's just keep playing because we're here and whatever. I mean, he's, you know, he, he wants to win. He's trying to shake things up to try to get better results in the win column. They are on a skid and he wants it to end. They're not trying to tank. He wants to win games. So looking at the situation as it is, we're going to see a different starting lineup and we're going to see what kind of results it produces. Again, you have a bit more comfort knowing that Thad Young is a veteran and you know what you have in him more than you do some of the other young players. Now, we'll see if it clicks. Laurie Markkinen just came back. And, you know, that's big having him back. Some people may be concerned about chemistry with him. And, you know, th this switch is going to maybe prove to be better or worse. You look at the main lineup that we've had when Laurie Markkinen's, you know, been here. White, Carter, Levine, Markkinen, Patrick Williams. And we're looking at a recent 2-6 and six record. Not so great. So let's see what these changes can do. It'll be interesting. Tonight they're playing the Toronto Raptors. You'll probably be listening to this when that game is over. And it's probably going to take a few games maybe to see what happens. And, you know, you argue that there is good chemistry already established between Sadoransky and Young. So if that can be implemented in the starting lineup and that can carry over, well, then maybe that will do good things for the players around them too. Maybe that will do good things for Laurie Markkinen. Maybe that can continue to build more on Zach Levine's great year that he's having. You know, Thaddeus Young has been a very nice piece on this team. So, time will tell. You hope that you could see some improvement here. And, you know, hopefully you could see some improvement from Kobe White if he's coming off the bench. I really don't know about Wendell Carter Jr. I... I want to like him, and obviously it's nothing personal, but mm, I'm just I'm just not seeing it. And I get it that the injuries have taken a massive toll. I totally, totally get it. But I'm just not seeing it yet. You see some flashes, sure. I mean, it's kind of similar with Laurie Markkinen. You see the flashes. When you see the good things happen, you get excited. And then the injuries come. And then the inconsistency comes when they come back. You know, it's this vicious cycle. And you just wish that there was more consistency. Obviously, you got to stay healthy. And, you know, getting hurt can be freak accident. And it's not like they're getting hurt on purpose. But when they are healthy, you want to see them establish some sort of consistency. Because before Laurie Marketing got hurt, to me, he was looking much, much better. And I think people would agree, he was looking much, much better this year than he was in years past under Egghead. I mean, which is really no surprise. All players are looking better now than they did under Egghead. 
as we kind of expected. But if you're not going to get the consistency, then you got to think about the future. Are you going to give a lot of money to Laurie Markkinen? Is Wendell Carter Jr. going to be at the center of your plan going forward? You got to see some consistency and some, you know, decent playing time first before I think you can make that conclusion with him. You know, with Laurie Markkinen, you're going to have to make decisions are coming up and you're going to have to make those decisions. And, you know, I think if Laurie Markkinen was healthy, healthy and continuing to play the way he was, you would be looking at the situation saying, okay, maybe you do have something here. Or you could say, okay, his trade value might be higher than ever. Could we shop him? It's just difficult right now that after that good start, he's been hurt for such a long time. And then, you know, you're going to be bailing consistency with him again. So it's a tough situation for the Bulls to be in. But we'll see what happens with this new lineup that Billy Donovan's put together. It'll be intriguing watching Thad Young in the starting lineup, in my opinion. I know he's not like a star player, but I think he's a very good veteran player. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. That's really all I had on the Bulls. Um, to finish up this show, at least on the Chicago sports end of it, We'll talk some spring training. I mean, you know, you're just in the middle of spring training. You're seeing some good things from either team. The White Sox pitching looks very good. Lucas Giolito threw very well the other day. So did Liam Hendricks. He threw a scoreless inning, their new closer. Garrett Crochet, who could be the next Chris Sale over there on the south side. He threw very well. I like what the White Sox pitching looks like. I think they could have the best staff in the American League, or at least one of them. I think this year, they got a hell of a pitching staff. You got a veteran in Lance Lynn who has really reinvented himself. Lucas Giolito has proven to be very good. And Dallas Keuchel's pretty good. Your biggest question that a lot of people are asking is the bottom of the rotation. How is that going to play out? You got Carlos Rodon as an option. You got Dylan Cease, who you're still trying to mold into a potential star. Reynaldo Lopez, who has been around a while. And I don't know. I, I, I don't see much with him. Because you know that Crochet is going to start in the bullpen. And you know, so is Michael Kopech. That's one of the big things, is Michael Kopech is going to start in the bullpen. To nobody's surprise. But either way, I mean, your bullpen outside Hendricks is also looking very good. Cody Hoyer looked very good last year. Um, I mentioned Crochet. I mentioned Michael Kopech. Um, Marshall, very good reliever as well. So... You know, White Sox pitching, that can that can take you to a World Series. I truly believe that. Meanwhile, on the north side, um, the offense this spring looks great. Jock Peterson is murdering the baseball. He is just scolding it. I think the Cubs got something special there. I really do. I think that he could really thrive well with the Cubs this year. Anthony Rizzo's hit some nice uh, home runs, and, you know, he's been hitting decently in spring. Javi Baez has started to heat up. He's been hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Hit an absolute monster shot the other day against the Rockies. And then, you know, Wilson Contreras and those guys. You know, your main core, you're looking to have them all rebound this year. And so far in spring, you know, it's looking pretty decent. Look at You know, looking promising. I know spring doesn't mean much, but... It's good to see some of these guys get off to pretty good starts and, you know, maybe give you some hope that they are going to perform better this year than they did last year. Because that's going to be key. You can't be as bad offensively this year as you were last year in that weird 60-game season. You just can't. But, you know, unlike the White Sox, the Cubs pitching is quite worrisome. I do think the rotation can be okay Jake Arrieta threw the other day. He gave up a couple of runs, gave up some hard hit balls, but he's still trying to work his way back. Kyle Hendricks, I'm not worried about. I actually do kind of like Zach Davies. He's no you Darvish, but I think he could be decent. We've seen some decent uh, pitching from Trevor Williams, the guy they got from the Pirates. And maybe a new environment can do some good for him. And remember, in 2018, if you were following anything that the Pirates are doing then... If you weren't, I don't blame you, but he was pitching pretty well, and then things just kind of fell off. So maybe a new environment could do him some good. 
And he's got family ties to the Cubs. His father was a big Cubs fan, so how much that does for you? Probably not a lot, but hey, you never know. Everyone's different. But the bullpen, that scares me. That scares me. Craig Kimbrell looks awful this spring. I, I cannot put emphasis on awful enough. He is getting tattooed. He is walking guys. So basically what he's been doing the past few years as a Cub, getting tattooed and walking guys. I mean, he looks terrible this spring training. And I'm not one to put too much on spring training stats, but boy, oh boy, the trends, it just, ugh. I don't think he should be the closer to start the season, frankly. I think you give that to Rowan Wick. And you see how that works. I just don't trust Craig Kimbrell anymore. Who would have thought anyone would ever say that? I mean, his Cubs tenure has been a disaster. And it sucks because he has been an all-time reliever until 2018 when he started to wind down a little bit with the Red Sox. He won a World Series that year, and then you saw the tail off at the end. But, I mean, before that, his career was beyond phenomenal. It was so incredibly good. Like, historically good. And now, oh my gosh. I mean, you talk about a fall from grace. And I know we saw some promise at the end of last year after a disastrous start, but that was a small sample size. I just, I, I'd love to be wrong. I would love to see him dominate again because I really do like Craig Kimbrell. I just don't trust it. I don't trust it at all. It's scaring me. And, then, you know, you had the Pedro Strope situation with COVID and, you know, you, you, you kind of... You kind of wag your finger at him a little bit and, you know, you just hope he doesn't do it again. And, you know, you still got to take this thing seriously. But how much does he have left realistically? Uh, that worries me too. Andrew Chafin could be a decent reliever. Brandon Workman could be a decent reliever. Do you trust... I mean, do you trust Rowan Wick to be healthy? I think he's got great stuff, but his health has not been there. Brad Wick only pitched a little bit last year. Is he going to be healthy? This bullpen scares the crap out of me. I'm really worried about that bullpen. But hopefully some of these spring training hiccups with Craig Kimbrell can work themselves out. I mean, it's going to kind of have to. I just, I, I just don't know if it will. I really, really don't. But time will, time will tell. I mean, we're just a few weeks away from opening day, and big news, the ballparks are going to be open here in Chicago. 20% at Guaranteed Rate in Wrigley to start. I did enter myself into the pool for tickets for the first drawing. Am I going to get picked? Probably not. It's a long shot. And I think most of the people attending the games are going to be season ticket holders to start. Because of 20%, it's only about 8,000 people at Wrigley Field. And, you know, guaranteed rate is pretty much... I, I think they might have a few more seats, but they're both pretty much... You both pretty much even them out at 40,000 seats, and it's going to be about 8,000, a little more, uh, to start the year. So, you know, it's not a lot. Not a lot of people. And the season ticket holders are going to get first priority. But there will be people back in the stands. And, you know, small crowds can be fun because, you know, the people who are going to go are going to be really into the game. And you could be nice and, sp I mean, let's just picture yourself there. You're at the game. You're not surrounded by people. You're nice and spread out. You're watching a ball game. You're enjoying a beer, a very expensive one probably, but you're still enjoying a beer at Wrigley Field or Guaranteed Rate for the first time in over a year. It's got to be a good feeling. It's a feeling I want. No question. And I'm sure Wrigley's going to do the rooftops too. I mean, they did last year. That was the crowd last year at Cubs games were rooftops. So yeah. And hopefully, when the fans return, we'll continue to see cases go down. And it being more safe. So that way, as time goes on, you can allow more and more people into the stands. You know, maybe by summer you raise it a, you raise it a little bit. 
I know Crane Kenny probably wants it to be full by the end of the year, but we really don't know what's going to happen in this world. It could, you know, I'm optimistic it's going to keep getting better. I am. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see. You know, could they be full by the end of the year? I can't say they will. I can't say they won't. Nobody can. Nobody can. It's a goal to have. Just, you know, keeping in mind that you want that goal, but you also want to make sure you're doing it safely. But, you know, if it is at least almost full by the end of the year, you know, then it'll be a big return to normalcy. But, you know, at least we can watch the games now where it's not just ghostly empty. Either Cubs or White Sox. It was weird last year to see Wrigley Field completely empty. You know, we're used to seeing Wrigley Field full of fans. And you know that, you know, the White Sox, now being World Series contenders, are going to draw more people. And, you know, they're going to, in normal times, they'd sell a lot of tickets and they'd get pretty full crowds too. But, you know, these are not normal times. So we just got to keep doing our part to keep striding towards that goal of getting better and, you know, being safe and making sure we can continue to return to normal like we've been taking our steps the past few months. Well, I think with all that said, that is just about going to do it here on Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I really had fun doing this episode. Um, but, you know, I got to say, I really respect people who podcast by themselves regularly. Because this is not easy to do. It is much easier to be bouncing and talking with somebody than just talking alone. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is fun to podcast alone from time to time. But boy, it is not easy. So thanks again for listening. I really hope you did enjoy this episode. I look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Hopefully, Sean will be back. A reminder, you can check out Swirsky Sports at SwirskySports.com. Check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you have not already. You could also check out Swirsky Sports Twitter at Swirsky Sports. And until next time, bear down. <laughs> We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down